Good morning. Good morning, kids. Where are they? You're supposed to be on the front pew, aren't you? Can you guys sit over? Could, I want you to be able to look at this beautiful painting up here. Has anybody ever seen this before? Some, some have, I know. Well, I want to tell you that this painting was painted by a very famous artist. Infamous, famous, however you want to put it. But can, what do you see in the painting, guys? A sun rising. Okay, a sun and a shining over the ocean. You see that too? Do you see any people? Can you see any people? Okay, you see a boat? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah? you can see the, the, um, the mast of the boat, right? It's a little sailboat with no sail. But do you see the people standing on the beach looking at the sun? Uh, yeah. You see them? Yeah. 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 <coughs> you see one? There's two people. They're kind of oh, looking away and looking at, towards each other a little bit. You see? Yeah. Well, well, would you like to meet the? Would you like to meet the artist that painted this picture? You, would you really like to meet him? You know what his name is? The person, who, the, the the artist who painted his name is his name is Pete. Yeah, here he is, right here. Pete the paintbrush. You want to see him? You can touch him. You, you want to touch him? Yeah. He, go ahead, pass him around. He's very special. He painted that picture. Right? Yeah. All by himself. Yeah. Do you think so? Do you think he painted that picture all by himself? No. So. He needed a hand. He needed a hand. Oh, okay. Edna is going to tell a children's story today. So, if I put that paintbrush down on the floor and I gave it some paint and I said, paint that picture, could he do it? So how, how did he do it? Edna gave you a hint. A man did it. A man did it. Somebody with a hand had to hold the paintbrush and dip it in the paint and paint it on the, on the, port, on the canvas, they call it, right? Right? So we don't, the person that gets credit for painting this picture is the one that held the brush, right? And you know who that was? It's right down here. Can you see the letters down here? Oh, they're hidden by the frame? The letters are SMB, which stands for my name because I'm the one who painted the picture. A long time ago when I could see, I can't, I don't paint anymore. But... Did you know that God is a painter? Matter of fact, God actually painted that picture. I painted this picture from a picture that was on a postcard, but the picture, somebody took it with their camera, it was actually standing on that beach in live, and God painted that picture. He paints picture with nature and different things that are out there, the sky and the trees and all the things you can see. But he paints other pictures, too. And guess what paintbrushes he uses? Do you know who his, paint, do you know who his paintbrushes are? Are there any paintbrushes in here, do you think, that God would use? Who? What? Where? All, everybody in here is a paintbrush, right? And God uses you and me and everybody out here to paint beautiful pictures. Now, the pictures that he paints, some of them you can see like this that are, you know, nature. But other pictures that he paints are like, well, take for advantage, for example, somebody carried that picture for me in here and put it up on this, 
um, pedestal or whatever it's on, was that nice? I didn't have to carry it in here. I'd have to go find the, um, what do you call that thing? Easel. Easel. I didn't have to go find the easel. He found it. And I'll tell you, that paints a really nice picture of, for me, because I can see God's love in what that person did. And you can go look at Ed later, because he is very loving. He did it. Okay. Thank you, Stephen. I had to give you credit for that, Ed. So when it comes down to it, you and I are God's paintbrushes. We can paint pretty pictures, like the one Ed painted by carrying this in here, or we can paint pictures that aren't so pretty by the way we act and by the way we speak. But the best thing to do is say, God, use me as your paintbrush today. Show me which colors to use. Show me what to say and what to do. And that way, God will be the painter. That's what we want, right? All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we want to be the paintbrushes. And we want you to use us in a way that paints beautiful pictures of you. So that people will see you in what we do and what we say. And they'll be attracted to get to know you. And Lord, we thank you for that we can be a part of what you're doing. Because it's a very special privilege that you've given us. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, guys. Thank you, girls. This morning's scripture reading comes from John chapter 4, verses 21 through 24. John 4, verses 21 through 24. And I'll be reading from the New American Standard Bible. Jesus said to her, Believe me, woman, that a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know because salvation is from the Jews. But a time is coming, and even now has arrived, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. We ask for the Lord to bless the reading of his word and pastor as he brings us the continuation of his message. Good morning, church. Happy Sabbath. Uh, it's good to be back home, and thank you for your prayers. And my family went to uh, Gillette, Wyoming, uh, for the uh, campery, and it was our first experience. And we have met many young people and leaders and the Pathfinder staff, and we had unexpected uh, storm there, but. Uh, thank you for your prayers that we could come uh, safely and also our pathfinders and also all those uh, participants could have a uh, wonderful experience with among uh, international uh, Campari uh, pathfinders and uh, thank you for your support and well since uh, we are gone. I hope that you enjoyed uh, sermons from my father-in-law as well. Uh, shall we pray? Dear Heavenly Father, as we open your word, speak to our hearts through the Holy Spirit. And we may see your beauty and your character through these words that I share and speak through me and forgive my shortcomings and as we open your word. In, in your name I pray, Amen. 
Uh, today's sermon is the generation of those who seek his face. And this is the, the hide and seek the sermon series. Leonardo da Vinci, the noted Italian artist, painted the Last Supper. I was amazed to see the picture that Steve he painted. I wonder it might be his painting. But anyway, I was right. But I'm so impressed how God has been using you in, in, in his uh, ministry. It took seven years for Leonardo da Vinci to complete the painting. The figures representing the twelve apostles and Christ himself were painted from living persons. The life model for the painting of the figure of Jesus was chosen first. When it was decided that Da Vinci would paint this great picture, hundreds and hundreds of young people were carefully viewed in an endeavor to find a face and personality exhibiting innocence and beauty. Free from the scars and signs of dissipation caused by sin. Finally, after weeks of laborious search, a young man 19 years of age was selected as a model for the portrayal of Christ. For six months, Da Vinci worked on the production of this leading character of his famous painting. During the next six years, Da Vinci continued his labors on this sublime work of art. One by one, fitting persons were chosen to represent each of the eleven apostles. With space being left for the painting of the figure representing Judas Iscariot. As the final task of this masterpiece. This was the apostle you remember who betrayed his Lord for 30 pieces of silver. For weeks, Da Vinci searched for a man with a hard, cruel face, with a countenance marked by scars of greed deceit, hypocrisy, and crime. A face that would describe a character who would betray his best friend. After many discouraging experiences in searching for the type of person required to represent Judas, Word came to Da Vinci that a man whose appearance fully met his requirements had been found in a dungeon in Rome. Sentenced to die for a life of crime and murder. Da Vinci made the trip to
to Rome at once. And this man was brought out from his imprisonment in the dungeon and led out into the light of the sun. At last, the famous painter had found the person he wanted to represent the character of Judas in his painting by special permission from the king. This prisoner was carried to Milan where the picture was being painted. For months, the prisoner sat before Da Vinci at appointed hours each day as the gifted artist diligently continued his task of transmitting to his painting. This base character representing the traitor and betrayer of the Savior. As he finished his last stroke, Da Vinci turned to the guards and said, I have finished. You may take the prisoner away. As the guards were leading the prisoner away, the prisoner suddenly broke loose from their control and rushed up to Da Vinci, crying as he did so. Da Vinci, look at me. Do you not know who I am? Da Vinci, with the trained eyes of a great character, sudden carefully scrutinized the man upon whose face he had constantly gazed for six months and replied, No, I have never seen you in my life until you were brought before me out of the dungeon in Rome. Then the prisoner lifted up, lifted his eyes toward heaven. He said, O oh God, have I fallen so low. Then turning his face to the painter, he said, Da Vinci, look at me again, for I am the same man you painted just seven years ago as the figure of Christ. What could Leonardo da Vinci see on the face of the model of Jesus or Judas? I'm asking to myself, what? would I represent today through my face? Many times in scripture, God encourages his people to seek his face. What does God want us to seek his face? Why does he want us to seek his face. A person's face 
reveals much about his or her character and personality. God wants to have a deeper relationship with us. This implies being face to face with God, which is a place of deep intimacy. If you see a person, look at a person for a long time, you or the other person would feel uncomfortable, right? Face to face with God, this is a place of deep intimacy. To seek God's face is to seek a deeper relationship with Him. God is looking for a generation of those who will seek His face. Today, we are going to study by reading through the book of Psalm chapter 24, verse 3 to 6. Psalm chapter 24, verse 3 to 6. I'm going to read Psalm chapter 24, verse 3 to 6. Psalm chapter 24, verse 3 to 6. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is Jacob, the generation of those who seek him, who seek, he, who seek your face. We read here that those of the generation of Jacob who are able to enter God's presence must have clean hands, a pure heart, and have not lifted their soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully. We are going to group a clean heart and a pure heart together and idol worship and swearing deceitfully together and examine these concepts in this particular order. When I read these verses, it makes excited to envision a new generation of worshippers arising who seek after God with all their heart, mind, and soul, and strength, and who are willing to sacrifice their lives to follow honestly after Christ. I believe that every so often a generation is born that truly turn runs after the heart of God. The evidence in scripture is clear that some generations chased after idols and foreign gods 
while others bowed down in submission to the God of Israel. For example, David was a man after God's own heart, and the people of his reign truly sought the Lord. However, his grandson Rehoboam sowed seeds of disobedience and ultimately bondage for Israel. Through a careful study of what it means to be the generation of Jacob, we can learn some concepts that will help us understand how to be a generation who seeks the Lord and how to be someone after God's own heart, as was David. We need to understand that the term Jacob is a general classification for any generation in which many people to turn to God and seek to worship Him. You have to wonder, though, why the term Jacob was chosen. When the biblical character Jacob didn't always demonstrate great faith. One example of Jacob's lack of faith was when he panicked in the presence of God's messengers, which is angels, when he found out that his brother Esau was coming to meet him. Even though angels were in his presence, he divided his family and servants, relying on his own human reasoning for protection instead of trusting in God's deliverance. Jacob may have experienced doubt at times, but he, he still understood how to worship God. As we will come to discover much of his desire and understanding of how to worship came from his life experiences from both time in the valley and on the mountain top. There are some qualities that we can learn from Jacob that will help us understand how to be true worshipers. You see the Hebrew words translated for us in the English as clean and pure also have other meanings in the Hebrew. That word clean can also mean blameless, exempted, free, guiltless, and innocent. Concerning the word pure, it can also mean beloved and is similar to the Hebrew word for son or heir. So we can learn from Galatians chapter 4 verse 1 through 7 that God has adopted us out of bondage to be his sons and daughters or heirs because Christ paid the rent redemption price which bought our lives and broke the shackles on our hearts. Many of us claim to be saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, but I don't, we don't 
always act like it. We swell deceitfully, we read, or idol worship here, Psalm chapter 24, verse 4, meaning that we, we say we are one person, but inside we are another. We say we worship God, but that we really worship our perhaps ourselves or material possessions. If we are going to be of the generation of Jacob and truly worship God, then we have to stop allowing Satan to distract us from God through the desires of worldly gain. We have to stop worshipping or idolizing things of the world. We have to stop working toward, stop daydreaming about, and stop allowing our hearts and minds to bow down and to serve the creature rather than the creator. Before we will totally submit ourselves to God and bow down to Him, we have to come to a point where we realize that fulfillment can't be found from the things of the world, its pleasures, or its ways. Jacob had to find this out the hard ways. When he heard that Esau was coming to meet him, Jacob fled and struggled with God on the matter of meeting Esau. He didn't just struggle mentally, spiritually, or emotionally, but he physically and literally fought with God. We read that Jacob wrestled with an angel, which is Christ, in Genesis chapter 32, verse 30, Jacob said, I have seen God face to face. God sought to bring Jacob back to his brother for a blessing, provision, and he fought the Lord because he was too scared to trust that God would protect him and too proud to humble himself before Jacob and before Esau. While he fought with God, he asked the Lord to bless him because before he would let go of his struggling. Would you please open your Bible, Genesis chapter 32. Genesis chapter 32. Genesis chapter 32, verse 22. And he rose that night and took his two wives, two, his two female servants, and his eleven sons, and crossed over the fort of Japo. He took them, sent them over the brook, and sent over what he had. Then Jacob 
was left alone and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. Verse 25 Now when he saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, Let me go, for the day breaks. But Jacob said, I will not let you go until unless you bless me. So he said to him, What is your name? He said, Jacob. And he said, Your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have struggled with God and with man and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked, saying, Tell me your name, I pray. And he said, What is it that you ask about my name? And he blessed him there. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel. For I have seen God face to face, and my life, was pre my life is preserved. Just as he crossed over Peniel, the sun rose on him, and he limped on his hip. Therefore, to this day, the children of Israel do not eat the muscle that sh shrank, which is on the hip socket, because he touched the socket of Jacob's hip in the muscle that shrank. When Jacob wrestled with God, it wasn't just mental or physical or emotional wrestle, but also spiritual. When Christ asked Jacob, what is your name? Of course, Christ knew his name. It wasn't that he didn't know and ask his name. When he asked the name Jacob, there was on purpose to have him reveal his identity. Jacob means what? And he had to admit that I'm a deceiver. He admit that his past. God, this is who I am. This is where I came from. I'm scared to face my brother Esau. Even though I saw the group of angels, I couldn't trust the angels could protect me. That's why I sent the two different groups to send before him. When he answered Jacob, Christ gave a new name, Israel, which means you wrestled with God and the man, and you have prevailed. We fight with God and say, why don't you bless me like you have blessed my neighbor, my parents, my siblings, my relatives? God's intention is to bless you and bless me. But we must trust that 
His ways are perfect and that His blessings are always better for us than what we can imagine. As Jacob wrestled with the Lord, God broke him right then and there. We have to come to a point of brokenness about our own ways and our own life before we will ever surrender and submit to God. The key is, are we humble enough to surrender ourselves to Him and to show humble attitude? We have to be humble before we will bow down and worship the Lord. After Jacob was humbled, we read in Genesis chapter 33 verse 3, Then he crossed over before them and bowed himself to the ground seven times until he came to his brother. We can say is it to praise God and bless the Lord and bless others. But there are times when I, when we need to humble ourselves before our spouse, before our children, or before our parents, or before our brothers and sisters at the church. We wrestle. We struggle. It is too hard to say, I'm sorry. Jacob finally submitted to God's will for his life after he was humbled and realized that he couldn't make it without the Lord's help. To be of the generation of Jacob, I and we must realize that we cannot find fulfillment in the things of the world. Our eyes must be totally fixed on the Lord. At the command of the Lord Jacob sought to be reconciled to Isa. This is important part to us. He reconciled with his brother. It's not something that I accept your blessing and I can go the other way. He had to face his reality that he messed up. When we look into our lives, our lives are perfect. It's very hard to admit our children that I made a mistake. We made a mistake. When we are raising you guys, we didn't know how to be a godly parent. We have failed in many ways. It's hard to admit to move forward. It's easy to say, I need God's blessing. But God's blessing means to be Christ-like. To have His character in our lives. That's where I struggle and we struggle. That's why many times we cannot move forward. And we stay where we are. Or we stay in the past. If Jacob received the blessing, but he still struggled and he didn't humble himself before his brother. We will not have the story of the Genesis that we know. But he totally surrendered himself to the will of God. And he practiced. He humbled himself and to say, 
I'm so sorry that I made mistake. And he bowed down seven times. Seven means perfectly he surrendered his will to God. Before we can ever hope to come into God's presence in worship and live in the peace of His blessings, we have to be about the ministry of reconciliation. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18 through 19. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 18 through 19. It tells us that God has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Reconciliation is forgiveness. There is no way we can worship God if we have not forgiven someone. Because we harbor bitterness in our heart and bitterness is a distraction to worship. If we desire to be of the generation of Jacob and not become distracted from worshiping God, then you and I must learn to either forgive those who have hurt us or ask forgiveness from those whom we have hurt. If we wish to ascend the hill of the Lord and stand in God's holy place, then we must show forth the characteristics of the generation of Jacob, the generation that seeks God's face. Brothers and sisters, are we ready to be of the generation of Jacob? As we study the character of the generation of Jacob, one common trait can be identified with the generation of Jacob. And it is the trait of self-sacrifice. We must get rid of the self that is in us and in me before we can bow down to God. Instead of, instead of placing any value or worth on our own lives, we must place God in the position of worth, worth. Because that is what the word worship means. Are we, give, are we giving enough worth to God? Are we giving enough value in our worship to God? If we don't, we are missing the main concept of the worship. Worship means to place something in a position of worth. Let's open, please open your Bible, John chapter 4, verse 19. John chapter 4, 19. Verse 23 and 24. 
John chapter 4, 19. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where we ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on the mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For Father is seeking such to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. So we have a generation contrasting, contrasting with all other generation. And the contrast doesn't reside in the name they wear. Neither in the message we preach, nor in the place we meet. It resides in a specific request, a quest utterly different from all other quests. Their heart is set on seeking God's face. Brothers and sisters, is your heart set on seeking God's face? If not, we are not of that generation. We might be a missionary. We might be a pastor. We might be an elder. We might be a deacon or deaconess. We might be feel that we are faithful. But if we are not seeking God's face, His character, we are not a generation of Jacob, Descartes. God is calling. Here, there is no room for the half-hearted. It is all or nothing. Consecration or delusion. There is nothing in between. Psalm chapter 27 verse 4 says, now the question strikes here, am I this kind of seeker? Am I from that generation? David was. Listen what he writes. When you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, Lord I will seek. And again, one thing I have desired of the Lord, that will I seek, and I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, 
to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in His temple. Church, are we seeking God's face in our lives? I told my son Isaac one of the most important prayers I learned in the Bible is I will not let you go unless you bless me. There is the place the worship attitude kicks in. Because we all struggle. God doesn't call Jacob because his life was perfect. But he sincerely, desperately, earnestly, he wrestled with God. And he didn't want God to leave. I will not let you go until you bless me. Church, where are we standing today? When we look into ourselves, there is no hope. One time we say, praise the Lord. After that, I fail or we fail. We can be like double-minded people or totally we can be the same person or we can be a totally different person. But why God chose Jacob as the model? Not because his life was perfect, but he knew how to wrestle with God. We are not coming to the church because we are perfect. At the Sabbath school class, we uh, talked about it. All sinners are welcome to the house of prayer. The keys our attitude before we coming in after we are leaving our heart is the same or is different God is looking for a generation who is humble and who wants to give their lives to Jesus every single day every single moment who can claim God I will not let you go until you bless me. If you do not have peace in your heart, this is the prayer I should and we should pray. God, I will not let you go because my heart is so broken right now. Please provide your peace in my heart. I have so much hatred in my heart. I will not let you go. Please bless me. I don't have courage to apologize, to ask for forgiveness. Lord, I will not let you go until you bless me, until you give me the courage to ask for forgiveness. I will not let you go until, Lord, you bless me. I believe all the church members and vis visitors who are here today, we can pray, God, I will not let you go because your presence is more than anything. I will not let you go unless you bless me. I hope this prayer may be my prayer and your pr prayer so that we can get closer to the heart of God today. Dear Heavenly Father, when I look into my heart, there is no hope. But when I see and when I lift up my face and toward you,
there is full of hope, and acceptance, and forgiveness, just as we are. And Father God, this is my prayer today, and our prayer today. I will not let you go until you bless me. No matter struggles and challenges or guilt or anything that or fear or anything that we are struggling right now, Lord, help us to wrestle with you, not against you, so that you come into our hearts, that we become more like Jesus. We may have strong connection in between you and us, that we can get closer to you and to the heart of God. So Lord, bless us today as we dismiss. Thank you for your loving kindness and faithfulness. In your name I pray, Amen. Amen.